This is the Wow Signal Podcast, a production of the Dream of the Open Channel. Episode 1, Antonio Paris is not from outer space. Welcome to the Wow Signal Podcast. This is your host, Paul Carr. On the Wow Signal podcast, we engage in an ongoing conversation with leading thinkers and investigators on how we can ask better questions, questions right at and beyond the limits of human knowledge. We'll proceed on the working assumption that our best hope of finding the questions, questions worth a lifetime to ask or answer, is to adopt a mental lens. The great Enlightenment thinker David Hume once said, It is impossible for us to think of anything which we have not antecedently felt either by our external or internal senses. So we humans can only understand new things in terms of ideas we have already understood, and we can only seek the best new questions through questions we have already asked. In this podcast, we honor this necessity. So for our mental lens... We will begin by asking a very old question that we have asked countless times, but have never answered well. Who's there? Is humanity effectively alone in the universe? And if not, who's there? Our lens, then, is the search for intelligences beyond the human and beyond Earth that are somehow within our reach. A good lens promises to help us see through our biases and expectations, taking us out of our comfort zone. If we choose to follow these new insights, this does leave us exposed. Some of that exposure is to ridicule, but here we are going to ignore any giggle factor. Far more challenging is the exposure to the sharp limitations of our own cognitive toolkit, to bafflement confusion, and anxiety. One of the themes of this podcast will be the close-in boundaries of our conceptual repertoire, and that to find even the tiniest kernel of truth, we must accept a life of doubt and uncertainty, facing an unknown that is much bigger and possibly smarter than we are. Some will find this thrilling and motivating but others would rather disown the sky. I'm not at all a pessimist. We uppity monkeys can, over time, puzzle through quite a lot and adopt mind-bending new concepts with a kind of rebellious joy. We reject the limitations of being survival machines for our genes, limitations that constrain how we explore, but not whether we explore. There is a great deal of confusion we can clear up, new knowledge we can hope to acquire, and best of all, I continue to hope for much better questions. It won't be quick or easy. Even the most tentative answers to who's there will take generations to acquire. All we can do is start and persist and be ready for when the universe comes knocking. That is why we have named this podcast after a single transient event that may have been a faint hint that we're not alone. When all is said and done, we may be alone. No one knows, and I'd advise against trusting anyone who says they do know. I plan to present music on this podcast by talented uncompromising artists whose music deserves much wider recognition. And so, we'll start with Aluchatistas and Vanished from their new album, Heads Full of Poison.
by Luchatistas, who are Shane Perlow on, on guitar and Ryan Oslins on drums. We'll hear more from them in a moment. We are going to start by asking in this episode whether there are non-human intelligences right here on Earth with us. If you have read my blog, The Dream of the Open Channel, you know that even seeing through the laughter curtain, I think the answer to this question is uncertain at best, and we can't entirely dismiss the null hypothesis. However, I also think it is a question that has never been adequately addressed. The entire field of UFOs has become a toxic swamp of pseudoscience, puerile pranks, sophisticated hoaxes, conspiracy-mongering, shoddy and often unethical research, New Age claptrap, cheap entertainment, and true belief. No serious scientist concerned for the future of his or her career will touch the subject of UFOs, and no one should blame them. Who would choose to drink from a poisoned well? No one is more to blame for this situation than the UFO believers themselves. Although among them have been many serious and thoughtful people who have been unable to stop the long, slow, downward slide into ridicule and irrelevance. None of this grousing about the UFO cesspool does anything to answer the qu serious questions that UFOs raise. But UFO research community is tired and beaten down with scant resources, hopeless commitments to failed cases, and little energy or plan for the future. What is needed is a new generation of serious, skeptical UFO investigators with the right training, the right approach, and a plan to move forward in the face of all the adversity the UFO community can no longer overcome. Joining me tonight will be Antonio Paris, Director, Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Group, and author of a new book. Links to Antonio's bio and for purchasing the book are available in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.blogspot.com. Antonio is a senior intelligence analyst for the consulting firm Booz Allen Hamilton, holds a top secret slash SCI security clearance, and supports an array of classified U.S. government clients in Washington, D.C. Antonio, moreover, is a former U.S. Army counterintelligence officer and Department of Defense Counterintelligence Field Activity Special Agent. He received his Bachelor of Science in Computer Information Systems from the City University of New York and his Master's of Science in Space Studies, Planetary Science, from the American Military University. Antonio is the author of Aerial Phenomena, Reviving Ufology for the 21st Century and the director and producer for the documentary Area 51. He has been researching the UFO phenomenon for over 10 years. We have Antonio Paris here. And hello, Antonio. Hey, what's going on, Paul? Antonio, you've been very busy lately. You've written a book. You've done a documentary, and you're planning a UFO conference in uh, May of next year. So um, I thought we'd start with a book and work our way towards the other items as we go. So the book is called Aerial Phenomena, Reviving Ufology for the 21st Century, and we have uh, we'll have links to that on the show notes where folks can go and obtain the book and read more about it. Um, Antonio, what what made you think that you needed to write this book? Well, I, I uh, first want to thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor. Uh, well, well, the the book is just a a piece of 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 the puzzle of of my mission to revive you. And, you know, we have the website, we have the Twitter page, we have the team, we have some documentaries, and it would be appropriate to also have a published book. So it's just one of many ways uh, for me to get my message across, and that, that main message uh, 
is still centered on that. There's a lot of hype regarding ufology, um, and you know, it, it's a it used to be a serious subject that's just been hijacked by by you name it, conspiracy theories, junk science, hoaxes, Hollywood, and it's it's gotten to a point where if you just mention the word UFO, uh, it, it's almost like a laughing stock. And 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 once again, the book is just one avenue uh, of approach that I'm taking to to educate the people regarding ufology. Okay, uh, now the, the book is introduction in four chapters. Um, the introduction talks about what we just you essentially just said. In sure. fact, this was the uh, the one year anniversary today, December third, of the first meeting of Aerial Phenomena Investigations Group. Um, in that year, um, what do you think you've accomplished as an investigator? Well, I, I at least from the from a whole team's perspective. Uh, the the what I wanted to accomplish was uh, set the foundation for the team, uh, set up a training process and a program, and continue to refine that training. And and as I, as we were doing that, it was getting the message across that hey, you know, is there anybody out there that's actually serious about this? And and the year that I researched before I, I uh, started my book and this, it was I don't think there is. So. Just, just, you know, we have a team now. Uh, they're, I think they're, they're, they're taking this serious. Their, their training is pretty well defined. And that in and of itself is a huge accomplishment. It's the, the mission was not to, to find, uh, uh, you know, evidence of extraterrestrial life the first year. The, the first year was not to, you know, put us on the map and say, hey, we're better than everybody. The first year was for us to, it's just like any organization, you know, or, like I told my team this weekend, we don't make soldiers, you know, straight out of boot camp. Uh, so it was to get a team together, train them uh, as much as possible, and to continue training, training, training. And while we were doing that, uh, uh, it was to get the message out that, that aerial phenomena, you know, we're a new organization, and that our intent is to, to take this subject to a different level. Okay. In chapter one of your book, you sort of summarize the investigative process. Uh, is this investigative process something that you developed yourself, or is it based on processes developed by other people? It was a culmination of both. Um, uh, I would say about half the processes in in my investigations guide is things that I developed while I was a, a counterintelligence agent and a DLD special agent. And that's just basic investigative skills that I learned in, in, in the dozen of schools that I, that I attended on how to collect evidence, how to interview witnesses, um, how to, more importantly, how to stick to the investigative process and not go into, you know, rabbit holes and, and conspiracy sites and etc. things that derail the investigation. So it's basic, basic things that you learn in grad school too, you know, how to conduct research, how to write, how to refine, how to analyze products, um, and then the other half was was a culmination of of just dozens of books related to UFOs. Uh, in particular, uh, MUFON. MUFON has a great investigations manual. Um, so I, I looked at some of that and kind of refined their processes to what I wanted to do. Um, thanks to them, and just just basic books on conducting forensics. Uh, you know, conducting interviews. Um, uh, basic how to con you know how to do a compass check, uh, how to read a map, any all those little things that you take to the field with you. Uh, so I took all these manuals, all these SOPs, all these you know tactics, techniques, procedures, what I call TTPs, and I didn't want to make a hundred or two hundred page manual that the team had to walk around with. Uh, so I, I I made it as condensed as possible to the basic stuff. Uh, and I try to keep that under 25 pages because, you know, uh, investigative techniques is, is something that you learn throughout, you know, it's experience based stuff. And, and that's what I've been trying to teach on a monthly basis. Right. Okay. And, um, you're still, um, looking for investigators to train. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so, uh, what I did initially was, uh, in 2012 was I tried to collect and, and assign as many cases as possible 
uh, 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 Mudan, Mudan cases, uh, not a, ho a whole lot of information. Um, but I did that on purpose, and that was so that the investigators can learn the processes and, and become better investigators. And uh, we're at a point now that, uh, for 2013, we're just not going to take any investigation now willy-nilly. So uh, they're at a point now where we're going we're gonna to triage the cases a little better. Um, I set some conditions so that when we receive a case, uh, if it meets certain criteria, then we'll open an investigation. And those criteria from, from next month and forward uh, will be uh, multiple witnesses, some type of evidence submitted, whether it's a photo or a sketch, uh, preferably a daytime uh, sighting. So now for next year, we're just not going to open up any investigation. And uh, uh, I think the team is ready now for serious investigations. Okay. Uh, chapter two of your book, which is um, probably most of the book, is actually it's, it's a lot of little chapters that are combined into one uh is the various cases that you've investigated over the last year or so sure um let's let's just highlight it two or three of those cases uh and tell us the quick story of those cases and how you came to the results you came to well uh, let's go back just one second there uh there's a reason why those cases were picked people ask me well why are these 50 why only 30 you know or why not all of them um and the reason was because those cases were the ones that the team fully uh, were able to exploit the investigative process. And that's from opening uh, to conducting investigation, collecting evidence, uh, uh, talking to witnesses and doing interviews, and then closing the cases. Um, and, you know, out of the 120 so cases that we did, uh, those cases were the ones that were fully exploited and completed. And that's why uh, I, I chose those cases. Right. Okay. And you list here uh, quite a number of cases in your sure. book, um, many of which um, end up being identified uh, or we conclude that the witness was um, – there, there's a couple that are closed as hoaxes. There's a, there's a number that are closed as very mundane things like um, a lens flare. Sure. Um, now, but there are some pretty interesting ones uh, where you're really not able to conclude what they were. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, Niagara Falls case? Sure. Well, that, that's that's really a a uh, a dual fold investigation. You know, it was initially a black triangle case, and nothing really nothing spectacular about the black triangle case. We get a lot of those type of reportings, uh, in particular up in the northern Canadian region for some reason. Um, so it was your standard case, two witnesses, observe the black triangle, silent. Um, and the description of the, of the black triangle is pretty much consistent with the reporting that's out there. A big giant triangle uh, with white lights, a red pulsing light, and usually it's silent. Sometimes you get a report about humming noise. Um, so initially I was going to, you know, we took the report, we were, we were like, okay, no, uh, no real evidence. You know, it was a sketch and, and witness testimony. But then the witness came back, um, and, and claimed that, uh, several months later, allegedly two men in black visited the hotel where he worked. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't there. So the, the, uh, the story is, is still third party. Um, and we did get some video from the witness, which was kind of went viral on the internet. And it was an interesting case at this point. Um, I don't have enough information to suggest whether or not uh, it was a hoax or if it was an elaborate hoax. Um, uh, so it's a very interesting case. And then uh, now there's there's another one in here that um, isn't really even a UFO case. Uh, that was um, the one up in uh, the Baltimore area uh, where a gentleman uh, reported finding a foreign object in his arm. Sure. Sure. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, that's that's what I uh, I would call one of the, one of the uh, close encounter cases. Initially, you know, when I started API, I, w I wanted to stick to mostly nuts and bolts type of reporting. I kind of wanted to stay away from uh, the alien abduction cases. But then I uh, Ray Long came on board, who studied psychology and had interest in in. Uh, ufology and abduction cases so i was like let's give it a try let's give this a try 
and he's opened a couple of cases and uh, and I was impressed with his reporting. Um, and then that case came along, the uh, the Baltimore case, where the witness allegedly uh, said he he woke up to find a unknown object in his in his arm. Um, and so the, the whole team went up there. We conducted the interview. Uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, I believe the witness. I didn't detect any type of anomalies that would indicate he was uh, being untruthful or was trying to hoax us. Um, the only evidence he had at the time was the alleged plastic bag where he put the uh, the, uh, the so-called foreign object. And, you know, the team conducted an array of investigation, you know, everything from testing it for radiation, uh, luminal tests, checking, checking for blood, uh, ch- trying to determine how the object would have or could have uh, uh, allegedly uh, melted from, from the bag. Um, so we, you know... After the case was concluded, uh, it's, it's one of those cases that are interesting, but we have no proof, uh, or for this matter, we have no. The witness had no proof that the event actually took place. Um, so, I, I lean towards closing it as identif- uh, unidentified because I didn't think he was lying. But then again, we still we just still have no physical proof. Right. Um, yeah, I, I thought that was an interesting case, but there's not a whole lot you can conclude from it. But. Um, it's just at the end of the day, it's just a, it's just a, it's a, a neat story, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's move on to the next chapter of your book, uh, chapter three, which is the analysis. Um, there, you break down the cases, and you have fifty cases you're looking at. It's remarkable yep. to me that you came in about the same percentage of unidentified as as the Condon report, about twenty percent. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you look at the community as a whole, they range from about twenty to five percent of of their caseload is usually unidentified. Um, but I took it a step further. You know, I said out of out of the ten unidentified cases we had there, when you really look at those cases, almost half of those unidentified cases, we really had really poor evidence. We really had uh, uncooperating witnesses. Um, so, you know, normally I would chuck those as, as you know, not reliable. I wouldn't even put them in the number crunch. Um, yeah. But but because uh, as an investigating entity received the case, we actually did something with it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's important that we actually add that to, to, the, uh, to the entire case load. You reported uh, 60% poor cooperation. Uh, yep. So. And that usually means... Um, the witness doesn't want to cooperate with the investigation, doesn't respond to our questions, uh, doesn't return phone calls, doesn't submit uh, a sketch or a photo that we requested. So, and that's, you know, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, they were trying to hoax us or, they, or they're just trying to pull a leg or et cetera. You know, a lot of times people just want to submit a case, get it off their chest, um, and then they just don't want to do anything with it. But it's it's I still you know categorize it as a uncooperating witness. Okay, um, chapter four is titled "Reviving Ufology." So, what's your plan sure. to help revive ufology? And and, and but before you stay, it, tell it, me that. Tell me why you think ufology is in trouble. You're breaking up, buddy. I'm sorry. Tell me why you think ufology is in trouble. I think it's in trouble because nobody takes this topic serious. If if uh, if if the science, uh, the sciences, the society, the government as a whole would be would uh, would be taking this subject seriously, then there would be a committee or, or some type of entity that's actually looking at this. You know, we we can't look and say. That the the thousands of people that are reporting strange objects are all crazy, or it's mass hysteria. You know, if you just take one percent of the thousands of reports that are reported throughout the year, that's still a, a pretty large number of, of people reporting strange objects in the sky. Um, but but to go back is you know I I didn't just pull that term you know uh, uh, abruptly. I did my research, and for about a year and a half. You know, I, I did what, you know, I went to several different conferences. I went to tons of local meetings um, uh, regarding UFOs. And I left with the sense that, hey, this is just a big joke to a lot of people, you know. And, and that's why when you mention UFOs, 
around, you know, serious colleagues. They laugh at you. They poke fun at you. They make comments about tinfoil hats, etc. And that's no fault but our own. You know, I, I, I go to the big international conferences and you see these conferences inundated with topics that have nothing to do with ufology. I mean, I've seen everything from Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, the Mothman, psychics, you name it. Uh, conspiracy and 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 that is why ufology just got this bad name and and if it was if it was a serious topic you, you'd walk into the library or the bookstore and you'd find books on UFOs in the science section but we don't we go in, you know we go in the bookstore and and you ask the person hey where's your UFO books and it's at the occult section it's at the witch section it's where the zombies are you know so it, it's really not a serious topic okay and and so what do you think needs to be done to revive ufology? Well, it's, it's going to be a very long process. I, my team, I told them yesterday, listen, this is just the first year. It might take four or five years uh, to, to bring this into a serious topic. So, and one of the first th ways to do this is, is we need to have an organization, and an organization that, that strictly conducts investigations from a nuts and bolts perspective, you know, uh, and not entertain conspiracies and not entertain alleged government cover-ups. Um, another part of this is is our first conference. If you look at our first conference, it's really subjects regarding the possibilities of extraterrestrial life. Uh, it's it's serious speakers. It's 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 you know we're not going to have vendors there selling you know uh, you know mind reading rocks and those types of things. Um, and it's getting the message out. You know I, I get a lot, I get tons of fan emails. On a daily basis, saying Antonio, you guys are doing it the right way. Uh, Antonio, finally, an organization that's taking the topic serious. Um, I'm not saying that other other organizations don't take the topic serious, but at times you look at these other organizations, you know, they towards the conspiracies, the government cover-ups, um, and the, and that's the stuff we're trying to stay away from. And and until somebody does that, which is our mission. Uh, the topic is just going to eventually just derail to a point where it's never going to be taken serious. Yeah, so UFO conventions are typically not very high quality, would you say? would say, yes, not high quality. Well, not high quality in a sense that it wasn't successful, successful for their, 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 you know, their intent. Um, but for the serious UFO investigator, you know, I, I don't think that, I don't think they're there yet. I see. So now, tell us about the conference you have planned in May of next year. Well, the, the conference in May, you know, it, it's one of those pieces, like I, I mentioned earlier, that uh, that we need uh, to get the message across. And, um, you know, I sat down with the team, and they all started giving me ideas. Oh, we need this person here. We need this person there. And they started talking about these uh, what I call the old school ufologists, and nothing against them, in you know, in their own little bubbles, and you know, they're really great ufologists. They're the leaders in ufology, um, but that's not the mission that I want. So I intentionally uh, decided to to uh, invite people that are new to the to the scene, and I want to grow these people to be the next leaders in ufology. So we decided that 2013. Uh, you know, in the spring of 2013, we will have our first aerial phenomena conference, and you know, I wanted serious speakers. Uh, you know, that that had really good science backgrounds, uh, as many PhDs as possible, or at least graduate degrees in the sciences. And and I think we got a pretty good list now. We we got, uh, uh you know, a good list of people that work for NASA, uh, people that work in the intelligence community, uh, people working with psychology backgrounds. And all, you know, if you look at the agenda list, they all have a, an important piece of the puzzle. Um, and, and that's what UFOCon 13 is about. Um, but I didn't want to really, uh, I guess, this is from, from, you know, the big dogs like MUFON. So if you look at the conference, there's a little flavor of MUFON in there because I think that's important that they also be part of the conference. Right. And um, let's see. The conference is in Baltimore? Conference is just outside of Baltimore. Uh, the hotel, for some reason, is called uh, Baltimore's, uh, uh, the Hilton Doubletree Hotel. Uh, and that's going to be on May 11, 2013, all-day conference. Um, and then 
afterwards, the conference, uh, we'll have our little, uh, I guess, after party at the hotel lounge. Um, and I think it's, it's going to be a really good conference. Our keynote speaker is a celebrity, uh, Bill Murphy. He's a lead scientist from uh, the sci-fi channel's Factor Fate. Um, if you look at his bio, uh, he's very well known in the UFO community. He's been uh, studying the phenomena for over 20 years. Um, and interesting enough, uh, he, he reached out to me. Uh, you know, I didn't reach out to him. He reached out to me and said, hey, I, I heard about this conference. I, I like your vision. I like what you guys are doing. Um, and he said it would be an honor if, if he can come to the conference. And I said, I can do better than that. I would like you to be the keynote speaker. And, uh, and he accepted. Great. So um, got a little bit of celebrity power going anyway. Um, yeah, and I think um, that will attract also the younger, the, the younger generation uh, right. uh, to, to the conference. And maybe some, some among some of that younger generation be your next uh, cadre of investigators. Exactly. You know, the team is growing. Um, I mentioned uh, yesterday at the meeting uh, that that I'm now looking for at least five more uh, investigators in in the area. Um, you know, and, and and that's the way. Just like any company, in order to be successful and continue to grow, uh, you need to bring in uh, other employees for, for you know okay. for all intents and purposes. All right. Um, we should tell people how they can obtain your book and how they can sign up for the conference. Um, this is all available through aerial-phenomenon.org. Is that correct? And, and they can also sure. record it. Yeah, if they, you go to the website. Right. And and your uh, air email is director at aerial phenomenon, aerial dash phenomenon.org and um, we can you can get the book th- at that website you can sign up for the conference you can watch videos uh, you can report UFO and um, if somebody's interested they can con- to becoming an investigator they can contact you there as well sure uh, I, I, you know I like to stress that um, as far as the conference is concerned right now we do have what we call the early bird registration um, and that's that's available uh, throughout the, the month of December. Um, so I encourage everybody to, to register. Um, and then also you get a free gift if you, if you do the early bird registration, which is it's a nice little tote bag uh, with a UFO Hunters you know, pen, patch, and a notepad. Um, but that offer does expire uh, January 2nd. And then afterwards, um, uh, the ticket prices will go up. Uh, moreover, uh, we do have discounts for, you know, current MUFON members, students, veterans, and military, as well as academia. Um, but then again, that those those uh, discounts also expire uh, come January. I see. I was, okay, well, let's wrap this up. Is there any uh, message you'd like to leave our listeners with? Yeah, this, you know, just a couple. You know, um, we get a lot of good feedback. Um uh, more importantly, is our main mission is to educate the people uh, regarding this subject. You know, we're not debunkers. Uh, we're not all skeptics. You know, we have a really good group of believers, you know, skeptics, and we come together, uh, you know, to to figure out what's going on here. Um, but, uh, you know, we're evolving just like any organization. So uh, as we evolve, our message evolves. Our website is also constantly changing because... Our fan base is getting bigger, and as that gets bigger, we have people demanding, you know, or asking for other things on the website, and we take as much as that in consideration, and and we add that to the websites. Um, but the best way to, you know, figure out what we're doing on a daily basis is to follow us on Twitter. You know, uh, with a, our tag is at you know Arizona, um, and that's where we post. Uh, okay. Well, we'll have links to. All those things in the show notes at sure. wowsignalpodcast.blogspot.org. Uh, one last thing, Antonio. Sure. Um, give somebody the quick thing to remember if they ever see a UFO, what should they do? Well, if possible, you know, I always want, you know, a, a great story is, is, is good, but a better story is to have something to back it up. And if, if, if you have a camera, if you if you're able to take a photo of a UFO or any object, that's the most important thing. Um, uh, because at the end of the day, we'll, we'll just have a story. Okay, 
Great. Uh, well, all right, folks, you can report UFOs, particularly Mid-Atlantic UFOs, to uh, Antonio's group at uh, aerialphenomenon.org. Links in the show notes. Antonio, thanks for coming on to the Wow Signal podcast. We hope to have you back someday to report on how you did. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Antonio. Good night. Please visit the Episode 1 show notes at wowsignalpodcast.blogspot.com for more information about Antonio, Aerial Phenomenon Investigations, and how to order his book, or go to aerial-phenomenon.org. You can follow Antonio on Twitter at at Aerial Phenomena. That's with an A at the end. You can also obtain his book through Amazon.com. And now... Another musical break with the Luchatistas, also from their new cuneiform album, Heads Full of Poison. This is Lighted Stairs. That was Aluchatista's with Lighted Stairs. Links to Aluchatista's website and for purchasing their music at Cuneiform are provided in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.blogspot.com. So, perhaps there are non-human intelligences active on planet Earth today. Or, in the very recent past, perhaps... I agree with the scientific consensus and with Antonio that the evidence for this is not persuasive. Where I part ways with the mainstream consensus is that I think there is enough evidence to warrant taking a closer look. I plan to work with Antonio and others to try to take this closer look. 
not just through field investigations of UFO reports, but in actively searching for entirely new classes of evidence, all the while asking sharper and sharper questions about what the phenomena are and in what ways they are anomalous. To do this, we need to be able to form hypotheses, which are probably going to be wrong, and test them to the best of our ability. If we do this right, whether or not we find the evidence we seek, we may clear away some of the bad air around the topic. When it comes to UFOs, there is a shop-worn old meme lying around frequently known as the Extraterrestrial Hypothesis, ETH for short. It still attracts both derision and true belief. The ETH can be summed up simply as some fraction, usually quoted at around 10%, of UFO reports are the result of something intelligently controlled that is not from Earth. Do you see the problem? It's the negative definition. By asserting that some UFOs, the otherwise hard-to-explain ones, are craft from outer space, we are really just stating what they are not. They are not ours, and they are not from here. But what are they? A good hypothesis tells us where to look, and what information we can use to test the hypothesis. The so-called ETH does not do that. It's not a hypothesis. Instead, I call it the E.T. conjecture. Since any real aliens are very likely stranger than we can imagine, an alien spacecraft could be anything, and we would very likely not be able to perceive or describe it completely or accurately. I won't address here the problem of the sparse, uneven quality of UFO data, or the thorny question of what phenomena to include, but even if we had terrifically good data, we still have no bona fide hypothesis to test it against. Not from here doesn't fit the bill. And at this point, we don't know where to turn. What happens in practice is that each of us invents our own private mental model of a single, human-like alien race and wonders why UFOs don't behave that way. Is there hope for the old ETH? Not as such, but I believe it will have better successors. I do hope for really high-quality hypotheses about the nature and behavior of an alien intelligent life that we can really use. The study of alien life, especially intelligent life, lacks a clear paradigm now and is starved of hard data. We're going to need lots more information and not much of it will be about UFOs, although I hope I am wrong. The new emerging science of astrobiology will probably tell us much more about the constraints on development of intelligent species than any of our deeply flawed perceptions and memories of things we are unlikely to understand at all. Nearly all hypotheses we develop about alien intelligences are likely to be wrong. Wrong, but the work of proving them wrong will lead us places we can't see at all right now. Now I'd like to close with electronic music by Mike Griffin, speaking from the dream, from his CDR Pulse Meditations.
You're listening to Speaking from a Dream by Mike Griffin from his CDR Pulse Meditations. Once again, thanks to our guest Antonio Paris of aerialphenomenon.org, Aluchatistas, Caneiform Records, www.caneiformrecords.com, and Mike Griffin of hypnos.com. That's H-Y-P-N-O-S dot com. Links to all these folks are provided in the show notes. Also, please visit my blog at disownedsky.blogspot.com to read more in-depth discussions of topics we cover on this podcast. Episode 2 of the Wow Signal podcast is still in the planning stages, but I hope to have a science fiction writer and scientist to come on to discuss the Fermi Paradox. It should be out February 2013. I'm still looking for someone who is interested in co-hosting and co-producing this podcast, probably starting with Episode 3. This is quite a commitment of time, talent, and energy, but will involve little or no layout of funds. If you're interested, please visit the podcast site at wowsignalpodcast.blogspot.com and click on Want to Co-Host This Podcast. This has been Episode 1 of the Wow Signal Podcast. To learn more, please visit wowsignalpodcast.blogspot.com. Inquiries at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com.